Good morning. My name is John Maisto. I'm president of the U.S. Philippine Society, and we are certainly happy to be where we are today here at Stimson because uh, Brian and the folks at Stimson are good friends. So the U.S. Philippine Society is really delighted to be partnering once again uh, but this time on a topic of central importance to the United States, the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Special thanks to Brian Eiler, who is going to moderate today's forum, and to the distinguished participants, <coughs> including <coughs> Ambassador Jose Manuel Romualdez, right here from the Embassy of the Philippines, DCM Busara. Kanchananalai, that's, uh, did my best. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Assistant Secretary Walter Douglas, thank you very much, Das Douglas. Acting Das, uh, Roland de Marcellus, and of another bureau in the State Department, uh, and a very important one. <laughs> and Society Director Paul Shomoloka of Alpha Technologies, and Paul's a member of our board of directors, uh, one of the younger ones and one of the more dynamic ones. Today's program builds on Stimson's continuing role in leading informed discussion here in Washington on infrastructure development in the Indo-Pacific region. And it follows directly from concerns registered publicly by Philippine government economic officials who have asked why American companies are not more engaged in that country's high-profile, pro high-priority, build, build, build infrastructure initiative. So we thought at the U.S. Philippine Society and here at Stimson that it made sense to bring together three <coughs> key cornerstone perspectives to examine this issue. First. U.S. government officials will describe the recent steps by the administration and the Congress, including the BUILD Act, to support American business abroad. Second, representatives from two Southeastern Asia countries whose governments have a high priority, a very high priority, on infrastructure development can talk about the role of foreign investment, especially from the United States, in their plans and in their vision and in their perspectives. And third, we have the U.S. private sector represented on the panel as well as in the audience to offer an American business perspective. I share your interest in the timely exchange of ideas and really look forward this morning to the presentations and the, sp and the responses to follow. With that, let me turn it back over to Brian, our moderator for the day. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, and I will just turn it to our keynote speaker, Das Walter Douglas um, from EAP Public Affairs to deliver a keynote. Okay, thanks, Brian. <laughs> Actually, I should note I have two jobs at the State Department. The other one is regional security policy, and that's where the Indo-Pacific comes in. So uh, I'll, I'll just mention that. Um, anyway, wonderful to be here. I was just in the Philippines in August uh, speaking about Indo-Pacific. I'm going out there again in February, uh, so looking forward to that. But I first made it out to the Philippines in 1982 as a backpacker uh, when I saw a diff the Philippines from a different level uh, and rode a lot of buses around a lot of backwoods and back roads and all that sort of stuff. So. Uh, uh, anyway, fell in love with the country then, went back a few times as a tourist as well, because uh, uh, just enjoyed it. Enjoyed Boracay Beach when it wasn't very crowded. <laughs> it certainly is now. Um, anyway, wonderfully with the Stimson Center. Ellen Leibson was a friend of mine. We both uh, served for Madeleine Albright a number of years uh, ago. And then I did a detailed CSIS, and uh, we used to grab lunch together a lot and that sort of thing. So if she's not in the crowd here today, I, I don't see her. Um, anyway, um, I know my time is brief, so I'll jump right into it. And it, it, it is wonderful to be here today to speak about the Indo-Pacific. And what I'll do is give you a quick <coughs> overview of it uh, and, and so you get some of the key points. 
Um, in 10 minutes, I've got to say everything I can about it. So I'm going to say right up, if there's one thing to get, to, to take away from what I say, it's the importance of private sector-led development. And, and, uh, and, and, and it's really the key to what we're doing. But let me step back a second and look at a little bit of the timeline. The President, uh, President Trump announced the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy at in Da Nang in November last year. Uh, and then Secretary Mattis spoke about the security pillar. There are three pillars, economic, governance, security. Uh, he spoke about it at Shangri-La uh, conference. But then the, the, the kickoff in a lot of ways came really when Secretary Pompeo on July 30th spoke at the Indo-Pacific Business Forum in Washington when he really spoke about the economic pillar. And he purposely led with that uh, because he wanted to emphasize the economic angle, uh, the economic side of our three pillars. He followed that up less than a week later in Singapore with all those ASEAN meetings um, on August 4th when he spoke about security and uh, stay tuned for governance. Um, so at any rate, we're, 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 we're laying out these three parts, and I'm going to really be focusing on the economic and governance side. I think security, uh, we know a lot about that. There, there are other folks who speak a little bit more about it than I do, say if you go to Department of Defense, but really want to focus on the economic and, and governance side. So the economic. What have we got here? <clears throat> well, the, 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 the general idea is fairly simple, and that is the Asia Development Bank has identified a $1.7 trillion infrastructure investment deficit in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, at the same time, it is identified that it was $50 trillion, the latest numbers are $70 trillion, that slosh around money centers in London, in, in New York, in Hong Kong, and a lot of other places looking for investment. And the point of the Indo-Pacific is to help countries become more attractive to that big pool of money so that they can come and fill in that $1.7 trillion infrastructure investment deficit. So I, I don't want to overwhelm with numbers, but those are some really basic ones uh, as we go forward. Why do we do it this way? Because it plays to America's strength. And that is, when we speak, when we look at the region, we have about a $1.4 trillion bilateral trade relationship. That's what a lot of people focus on. But the real difference with the United States, with other countries, is we have approximately $940 billion in FDI, foreign direct investment, in the region. Uh, this is a tremendous amount. These are high paying jobs. These are, these are high quality investments. These are the kind of things that a country really wants. Uh, and so our goal is to use the private sector because that's really the United States' strength is creating conditions for the private sector to come in um, and let them do the job of, of development. It is our belief that state-led development does not work. Uh, there are serious flaws with it. Um, we've seen some recent articles about Sri Lanka, elections in the Maldives and, and, and Malaysia, and there are a lot of other examples. The Financial Times has been running quite a few articles on state-led development. And we've seen a lot, there's a, the, the result has been uh, a lot of projects where they're not needed, a lot of debt that's not necessarily uh, repayable, and all sorts of problems that come with it. And you also look at the fact that when I mentioned that $1.7 trillion infrastructure investment deficit in the region, no government can put up that kind of money. Only the private sector has the money that will, will, will satisfy the needs out there. That's why we play to America's strength, which is FDI, foreign direct investment, as well as trade, uh, and we, we have it private sector led. <clears throat> when we break down the break out the economic side, we, we really have focused on, on three areas. So, and those are digital economy, infrastructure, and energy. So, when the secretary announced in July 30th going forward, he announced 119 million dollars in money that can go to these three areas. Uh, and we came up with these areas not just by the United States government but by engaging in discussions with our allies and partners in the region saying what makes sense. And it was those three, digital economy, energy and infrastructure, that we reached a, a consensus on this is where the, the investment has to go in. So we, have we are developing programs now that will focus on these three areas. Let me say right up front, we have the money, we have the, the area we want to be investing in. What we are now doing is working out the details of how that will be. It's very important for us to get it right. Uh, we're not just going to throw money at a, a problem. 
We're going to make sure that the bureaucratic structure is in place, the incentives are in place, the government has wide agreement, a whole of government approach to what we're doing. We want all those in place before we announce these. And I'd say the same thing with the Build Act. I don't want to get too much into it because my colleague Roland here will be going in more detail on that sort of thing. But what we want to do is make sure we get it right. Uh, and so in everything we do, uh, because we do get it right, we just don't throw money right away. We're going to make sure we get we're, we're, we're all, that, that there's, a, there's a consensus about how to go forward with input from a lot of private and public sector uh, entities as, as, we, as we move on. Um, the Putting these together, all that I, sp I spoke to you, that is basically what we have as our economic pillar. <coughs> the other important one that's really linked to it is governance. And I think we've, we've really had some tremendous examples. And let me say when these three pillars were created, we didn't have these examples. But we had the election in Malaysia in May, and we had the election in the Maldives in, in uh, uh, it was a month ago or about, about two months ago, which showed the importance of the ability of a government to, uh, and a people to look at what's being done in, in loans and in infrastructure development. And it's, when we speak about, I, I mentioned those elections, but what I really want to focus on is open, transparent, rules-based. Um, any government can have that. But it's very important for the capital to understand what it's getting into, where that investment is going. And when it has that, it can make decisions and the money will go where it's needed not where there are political favors to be done or by other, some other investment criteria. And so therefore, when we look at our programs, and this really falls under the governance, governance side, we want to make sure that the, the, the governments in these countries can be, have openness, transparency, and a rules-based system that will attract capital. Someone said capital is a coward. It doesn't go where it doesn't believe it, it, it can get a return, where it's protected, and that sort of thing. Um, let me say, finally, that, that as we look over the, the Indo-Pacific area, uh, and I, I should note it's Indo, not India-Pacific. It does go from the west coast of India. It includes Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, as well as India. While India is the biggest economy, it does include those others and the, the, the ocean space there. Uh, that as, as, as we look at this region, um, what's really important for us is to even out the landscape. And one of the concerns we have now, when I mentioned that $940 billion in FDI we have in the region, it's rather unevenly applied. There are certain countries that get a lot and others that get a little. And it is our hope, it is our aim, that we can take those that get very little FDI and get up into the medium level, and those at the medium level can get to the higher level. Um, and that's what we're going to be working towards, is graduating those up working as partners with the governments there so we can even it out, not to take away, say, uh, uh, investment that's gone to the, the, these ones that get it now, but to rather bring others up so that they approach those, those ones that do get more investment. And that's really what we're aiming to do with this, is to, to make it so that the whole Indo-Pacific can benefit from the private sector investment, not just those select countries that already have that open, transparent, rules-based system. Uh, and that's what, what motivates us as, as we go forward. Um, I'm going to, just to wrap it up, I mentioned a timeline, how we've gotten to where we are, set what Secretary Pompeo has done. I think to, what to look for next uh, is uh, Vice President Pence will be out at the APEC uh, meeting and in, in, in the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the ASEAN meeting in Singapore and the APEC meeting in, in Papua New Guinea. He will be giving a major speech out there and he will be making a lot of comments on the side. So I think you'll hear our next public iteration of what's happening with Indo-Pacific there. Um, and then we're looking at a number of events after that, uh, but the, the immediate one is uh, Vice President Pence going out to the region um, and addressing the, the, the economies as, as well as other things uh, out there and how we're going to go forward. So you'll hear some more. That's, uh, our speechwriters are very busy, uh, very much interacting uh, with, with, with um, uh, the Vice President, feeding material in. But uh, I think you'll, you'll be hearing about the Indo-Pacific again at, at that time. So I know I only have 10 minutes. I think I made it. Uh, and what I'll do is stop there and sit down. And I look forward to hearing what the panel has to say. Thank you.
Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming to our event. As you can see, it, it is, is uh, very heavily attended. Um, we had about 160 RSVPs. We were over capacity for this event, and uh, many are tuning in on the live stream. Um, I think this just goes to show for the level of enthusiasm there is uh, about these new initiatives focusing on infrastructure and development opportunities in the Indo-Pacific coming out of the U.S. government. Um, and uh, I want to particularly commend Das Douglas and his team uh, for all the work. And I think you're ta you've talked about a broader team that's working on this, uh, not just in uh, the administration, but also in Congress to deliver these, these new initiatives and help us learn more about those initiatives. Uh, my name is Brian Eiler. I am the Stimson Center Southeast Asia Program Director. I also wear another hat here as the director of our Energy, Water, and Sustainability Program. Uh, and we, we're working with these stakeholders here um, in Washington, as well as in ASEAN, to identify strategic and pragmatic impact areas that these Indo-Pacific initiatives can land on to make a difference. Um, and they're very happy to convene this event today and this discussion forum. Um, I believe that uh, two points uh, were particularly salient from Das Douglas's speech. One is utilizing U.S. resources to unlock billions of investment uh, that can be poured in, if not trillions, uh, that can be poured in to filling the infrastructure gap in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so this is, again, not a state-led program, but it's a way to unlock private sector resources. Um, secondly, um, I, I particularly appreciate the emphasis on building partnerships, and I think that's why we've convened our ASEAN forum here uh, with stakeholders from ASEAN, with stakeholders from the private sector. Um, and and um, by no way is, is what we've convened here representative of the entire Indo-Pacific. So we've invited kind of a, a small section of, of stakeholders to engage with you um, and engage with the policy community that has um, come today, that is paying attention, to engage with think tanks and acad uh, academics who are thinking about how are we going to make a difference with these new and in emerging initiatives in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, can we provide quality alternatives to what is being offered currently in the Indo-Pacific? And in which sectors do we have comparative advantages? Uh, so today we've invited representatives from ASEAN governments, from the U.S. government and the private sector. Ambassador Maisto already gave introductions um, to have a conversation uh, uh, amongst ourselves and then to open it up to you um, at the end of our event today to hear your comments, critiques, uh, as well as discussions of opportunities. And our, our mission is simple, to identify opportunities uh, in which these new emerging U.S. initiatives can engage in the Indo-Pacific. So the, uh, the program is to offer each of our panelists a, a brief opportunity to present on these opportunities or discuss criticisms of what is coming out of the U.S. government um, with mine to... Um, to identify ways in which these initiatives can be tweaked, can be adjusted to make an even a, a greater impact. Uh, and after that, I will host a structured discussion, um, followed by a conversation open to the audience. So first, we're going to ha hear from Ambassador uh, Jose. Um, sorry, I've got to make sure I get this right, because I call him Ambassador Babe. Um, <laughs> Ambassador Jose Manuel de Gallegos Rom Romaldez. Um, who will give a brief introduction to opportunities in the Philippines. Okay. Thank you, Brian, for, um, for that uh, brief introduction. Let me just uh, also thank um, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Douglas for that comprehensive keynote address and um, also the Stimson Center for organizing this together with the U.S. Philippine Society, headed by Ambassador John Maisto. Uh, Hank Hendrickson and Ambassador Tom Hubbard. As we talk about our shared interest in the infrastructure development, please allow me to briefly speak on the Philippine priority objectives of infrastructure. The Duterte administration just passed the two-year mark at the end of June, and we pretty much remain on course towards all our medium-term goals. These goals are to reduce poverty in incidence from 21.6% in 2015 to about 14% by 2022. And we would like to induce more investments to open up more jobs for the next generation of Filipinos and to make our growth more inclusive.
by addressing the infrastructure deficiencies that stymie productivity. It is that last goal which I will focus on this morning. The Philippines Infrastructure Investment Plan, entitled Build, 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 is thought to be one of the boldest and most ambitious infrastructure programs in our nation's history. The administration's goal is to invest over $170 billion in the next six years into the country's infrastructure development, and by 2018, or this 2018, government plans to rump up infrastructure spending to approximately $24 billion, and by 2022, 2022, the government is expected to spend about $38 billion, or 7.4% of our GDP growth. For the next 50 years, or for over 50 years, the Philippines' infrastructure of investment averaged only about 2.6%, <laughs> while our neighboring economies invested double that ratio, which includes Thailand. Underinvestment in infrastructure produced a large gap that resulted in congestion and inefficiency. We are seeking to correct that gap by investing in about 75 key strategic infrastructure projects over the next medium term. Today, I am proud to inform you that the Build, Build, Build program is gathering momentum. <coughs> From January to July this year, infrastructure spending increased by about 47 percent compared to the same period last year. This represents improved capacity to execute priority infra uh, infrastructure projects. We also plan to run a deficit of 3 percent of GDP up to 2022 to allow enough fiscal space to fund our economic <coughs> investments. Over the next few years, we will make heavy investments towards upgrading our ports and airports, creating new rail lines, and improving mass transportation, providing bridges to link our islands and road systems to bring our farms closer to our cities. We are fortunate to have the full support from our friends in the region. Both Japan and China have committed about $9 billion each in investments and official development assistance, while South Korea has pledged about $1 billion in ODA under President Rodrigo Duterte's term. These commitments complement the support we are getting from multilateral development institutions. The Metro Manila subway system, or subway project, is by far the largest ever infrastructure project we will be undertaking. It is also the recipient of the largest ODA we have received from Japan. Let me also assure you that the economic buildup we have undertaken is also supported by prudent decision-making on the identification of projects and a sound financing strategy. Our financing mix continues to be inclined towards the domestic market to avoid the vulnerability from exteller markets. We are carefully managing out the debt-to-GDP ratio, which is often the more usable ratio to appreciate our public debt. Notwithstanding the increased borrowings to finance investments, our debt-to-GDP ratio is expected to fall from 42% in 2017 to about 38% by 2022. Our economic managers emphasize the multiplier and expansionary effects that investment in infrastructure and connectivity and construction. The goal of this administration is likewise to continue stimulating investment in the modernization of urban areas in Manila, while incentivizing great investment in the rural areas. Enhancing the connectivity of these areas to markets will be improved through the investment in railways, secondary and farm-to-market roads, cold storage areas, and processing centers. I would like to end this brief comment by recalling that one of my first meetings upon assuming my post here in Washington, D.C., nearly a year ago, was to attend the Philippines-U.S. Bilateral Strategic Dialogue. At that meeting, our delegations exchanged views with officials from the Commerce Department, the Treasury Department, U.S. Exim Bank, OPIC, and USTDA on how we can collaborate on intensifying U.S. engagement in the Philippine Infrastructure Development Program. Over the course of the last year, I have followed up on the key messages in my meetings with U.S. government officials, legislators, and corporate executives. I am therefore encouraged by the passage of the BUILD Act of the various Indo-Pacific region or infrastructure <coughs> or Indo-Pacific initiatives, 
such as the Asia Edge. It is my hope that our discussions this morning will be the beginning of many more so that we may be able to act on our shared goal to continue and work closely to ensure that people get the benefit from the potential infrastructure projects at the soonest possible time. Thank you, and I look forward to the panel discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And we all look forward to engaging with you later on in our discussion. Our, our next speaker is DCM Kun Busara from the Royal Thai Embassy, um, who I believe has put together a, a brief set of remarks to talk about some emerging regional views uh, for Thailand as well as uh, particular sectors in which uh, can be impacted in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I would like to join Ambassador uh, of Philippines to uh, thank the Stimson Institute, Shamat, and uh, uh, that's Douglas for the introduction and for today's event. And uh, today, Ambassador, he himself, he would like to be here, but uh, he's on official mission, which has been uh, uh, pre-engagement. And uh, so he assigned me to be speaking on his behalf. So today's topic, uh, Building Indo-Pacific ASEAN Stakeholders Forum. This is very timely in light of the recent passing of the Built Act into law. And uh, for the benefit of time and uh, the time limitation that I have around seven minutes, so I will today uh, make a brief uh, presentation of the key areas in three key areas. And uh, I would be more than happy to uh, discuss and uh, answer your question during Q&A session. So the first point that I would like to highlight is that Thailand, we support strong and active U.S. engagement in the region, particularly in economic engagement, as uh, the class has mentioned. And uh, we welcome the emphasis on the economic component of the Indo-Pacific strategy, as outlined by Secretary Mike Pompeo at the Indo-Pacific Business Forum in last July. The economic matter is a driving force in the region, especially in Asia. So uh, this is why uh, <coughs> I would like to uh, invite the United States and uh, key dialogue partners to be uh, one among the participants and uh, uh, player in the region in this very uh, competitive landscape of uh, Asia. And in this context, uh, Secretary Pompeo's speech was a good start. And uh, after that, the passing of the law is another big step, which uh, will bring the uh, engagement of the United States in the region into a meaningful and tangible uh, measures. This is the strong determination of the United States have been acknowledged by ASEAN and other countries in the region. So we would like to encourage the United States to translate these measures and strategy into uh, action in the future. The second thing that I would like to highlight in terms of ASEAN, as member of ASEAN, Thailand joins ASEAN member state for a stronger, and closer strategic engagement of our, of United States. We would like to see uh, our partnership between the United States and ASEAN grow stronger and stronger. And uh, it is our view that a stronger ASEAN would be vital for uh, the idea of Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So we welcome the recent uh, emphasis, emphasis that uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy, the ASEAN centrality is recognized and highlighted. And we believe that uh, um, in terms of potential, there are lots of uh, bankable and uh, 
potential uh, investment area that private sector would be interested in doing business in ASEAN. Right now, um, ASEAN has a combined population of 600 million people, and uh, we have projected by 2030, it's going to be the fourth largest economy in the, in the, in the world. So it is vital for ASEAN, in, ASEAN growth and the U.S. growth as well. So far, there are a number of uh, ASEAN, uh, U.S. private sector in ASEAN, but we believe that there are still lots more potential to be tapped. For example, right now, we have, uh, according to the study, we have about 81 million households of uh, urban consumer in ASEAN. And it's expected by 2020, there will be a larger number of household consumer in ASEAN going up double to around six, I'm sorry, 163 household uh, consumers. And for tourists, there's gonna be 500 million tourists expected to be in the region. So there's a lot more infrastructure and investment to be uh, uh, open up for the potential investor. And as an incoming chair of the ASEAN for next year, we look forward to working closely with our dialogue partners, with our U.S. counterparts in the highlighting and uh, putting up our economic partnership in a higher plane for the United States and ASEAN together. So we would like to explore how the newly established International Development Finance Corporation and other economic initiatives under the Indo-Pacific could complement, synchronize, and synergize with what ASEAN is doing in terms of promoting seamless and effective connectivity within the ASEAN region and beyond. We have ASEAN connectivity and we would like to see uh, how the Indo-Pacific strategy would uh, work together and complement and uh, synergize with the ongoing efforts of our community building. We would like to see also, not only in terms of progress and prosperity, but we would like to see in terms of sustainability, as uh, Dust Douglas has mentioned. We would like to see how the United States would be involving in the measures and uh, ongoing efforts to promote sustainability, development sustainable, according in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030. So the third point that I would like to highlight, I was scoping down from ASEAN, so I was scoping down to sub-regional organization, sub-regional uh, cooperation. In ASEAN, we have uh, a number of uh, sub-regional organization working as uh, uh, part and parcel in building ASEAN. In the, we have uh, Bimpiaga, which is the Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines growth area, linking uh, the sub-regional in the region, the land, the, the sea, linking the sea, uh, the island country of ASEAN. And in, for the inland ASEAN, we have certain sub-regional organization or cooperation, but today we would like to highlight just a few. Uh, <coughs> we would like to highlight in the lower Mekong area which is one among the most potential area in the region. So we would like to see uh, more and more U.S. engagement in the development of Mekong sub-region, which is, I can say that it's a new frontier of growth in the Indo-Pacific. A successful Mekong region will contribute to a successful ASEAN uh, community and in turn, we hope that it would be contributing to a successful Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So I would like to highlight with regards to the ACMEX. Today in July, uh, to this year in July, uh, Thailand has the, the honor of hosting the summit, the leader summit of the ACMEX framework 
or in full is Eyawadi Jao Praya Mekong Economic Cooperation Strategy, which is the name of the three main rivers in the region. The members of this uh, strategy group framework are Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. This ACMEX framework was established in 2003, and uh, the the objective of the establishment of this framework is to bridge the, uh, the development gap between the country in lower Mekong area and promote sustainable development and the well-being of people. One of the main um, character of this uh, framework cooperation is prosper thy neighbor. The ACMEX summit in Thailand in June this year, we have uh, Adopted the, the leader has adopted the first master plan for year 2019-2020 under the vision of ACMEX uh, for building the ACMEX Connect by 2023. Actually, I find lots of uh, correlations between ACMEX and the ongoing master plan on uh, ASEAN connectivity, which uh, works on connecting infrastructure, uh, making sure that uh, institutional uh, connectivity will be established and also promote people and people links. So in ACMEX master plan, there are three pillars under this plan, which are the first, seamless ACMEX, second, synchronized ACMEX, or harmonization of uh, rules and regulations, and the third, smart and sustainable ACMEX, which will, of course, the main goal is for the people. So within this master plan, there are various projects that reflect the need and demand of countries in this sub-region. Also, the leaders endorsed Thailand's proposal to establish the so-called ACMEX fund to ensure sustainability of financing the projects under this master plan and we are open door for development partners. So we are believe that, uh, we do believe that there are potential complementarities between the ACMEC three pillars and also three pillars of economic component of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. And we do hope that, not only hope, but believe that there could be uh, synergies between the Lower Mekong Initiative of the United States, or LMI, and ACMEX. So I believe next year, we promise that it's going to be a very exciting one. Once Thailand become a chairman of ASEAN, we will continue what uh, our leaders have adopted from the past and previous ASEAN uh, um, chairmanship to make sure that ASEAN will be inclusive, yet outward looking and forward looking and open to our development partners and dialogue partners. So we are very much uh, look forward to working with the US government, business sector, private sector, and all think tank on how can we, uh, how we can implement uh, the synergies between the ongoing connectivities and strategy in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kum Busara. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to have you here with us. I, I believe um, your your last suggestion of linking the U.S.'s Lower Mekong Initiative to the ACMEX uh, regional framework is one of particular use because instead of starting, let's say, a new set of initiatives in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. here's something that's well established. It's going into its 10th year. Um, it focuses on the various um, sectors of which have already been highlighted, infrastructure development, energy, water, mm -hmm. sustainability, human capacity development. And, um, and it's there, it's ready to go. So I, I, I particularly want to uh, highlight that last linkage. Um, and for everyone, I hope that ACMEX is something that we become familiar with 
as we think about ways to engage with Southeast Asia. It's not the easiest acronym, um, but remember it for three rivers, mm -hmm. the Arawadi, the Chao Praya, and the Mekong, ACM, um, Economic Cooperation Strategy. Next uh, in our docket of presentations, um, we have a private sector representative, uh, uh, Paul Shmodoloka from uh, Alpha Technologies. Um, I was introduced to Paul through um, our good colleague Hank Hedrison at the uh, U.S. Philippine Society, and um, who said, Brian, we need to have the private sector represented at this panel. Um, and I'm happy to say that Paul has agreed to fly in from the West Coast to, to, um, to talk to us today. Very quickly, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, about Alpha Technologies, we could describe it as a medium-sized enterprise with a global footprint in energy as well as telecom, yeah. um, and doing some really cool things like energy backup all over the world. When, when systems fail, Alpha is there. Um, is that your tagline? Um, <laughs> one of many. Okay. Um, and another is, um, which I'm learning about, our underground, uh, underwater solar installations uh, in the South China Sea um, uh, to support some activities there. Um, where power is needed. So, yeah, I can give a bit of a description. Great, great. So, to you, Paul. So, um, first of all, happy to be here uh, as the uh, West Coast representative. You know, coming from the West Coast, we are extremely Asia focused culturally, um, you know, as well as that, those are our, very often our nearest uh, foreign borders. So, uh, being kind of bi coastal, I can say we are um, very Asia focused uh, being out there. Uh, I do represent a medium-sized uh, U.S. technology company. We're about $600 million a year in revenues. Our principal market segments are in broadband, telecommunications, renewable energy, industrial markets, traffic, and transportation. So um, as Brian said, we play in the power space. So we provide critical infrastructure for those market segments for when the power goes out. Uh, in the renewable energy space, we actually provide enabling technologies uh, where we enable people who don't have access to power to either use uh, solar, wind, or other means, and we provide the power electronics and the batteries and the control systems that allow them to have access to energy. Uh, so, for example, should you be on an island and uh, need to power a telecommunication, a mobile cell site, our equipment is the brains behind the, between the solar panels and, and we provide the storage that allow people uh, uh, to uh, have electricity to power that site. And I use that example because, for example, in Indonesia, we power over 8,000 mobile um, cellular sites that uh, don't need to use generators. Um, so uh, the profile of the company uh, is that I handle our global business. So I look at all markets, um, Europe, Africa, Middle East, uh, Latin America, and Asia. And Asia has always been the most one of the most challenging markets for a U.S. company. And I can say, honestly, probably if I look at anybody's uh, revenue breakdown, uh, it is uh, uh, usually Europe and Latin America are the principal export sources, and Asia is the toughest market to operate in. Um, we are an exporter, so we do manufacture in the United States. We have a complicated supply chain. We also have contract manufacturers in China and India, and I'm hoping soon in the Philippines uh, and in Mexico. Um, it is fun to be here to talk about something proactive and not just China tariffs. One of my recent trips uh, <coughs> mostly about how to deal with uh, tariff situations and how we're going to change our supply chain. Um, I do want to say that uh, in listening to the previous comments, um, the intent that I'm hearing with uh, uh, you know, today from Ambassador Romaldez and, and, and my, my colleagues on the panel is, is great. It all starts with intent. But I live in the real world of quarterly results and uh, ones where we have to close deals. And uh, it is a great challenge as a company that does manufacture solutions as a part of larger infrastructure projects you know, to access the market, um, especially in Southeast Asia. There are a myriad of challenges. Uh, and I'm just going to touch on, on some of those, uh, but I'll give a couple of other kind of uh, you know, comments. Um, the, uh, uh, one other com comment made earlier about governance. And governance is, governance is critical and transparency on the governance sector, but we face a tremendous amount of challenges as an exporter in terms of private sector governance. Um, many of our competitors out there, mainly from one very large country, um, you know, would be pretty much violating every SEC regulation and Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the private sector. They have methodologies that are extremely predatory when they come in on projects and they 
uh, corrupt the buyers. Um, and I, I will make no bones about it, but uh, I'll be very blunt about it. But it's, it's tough out there when you have to uh, operate from a level of transparency, and yet others don't. So the playing field is not level on the private sector. So governance and initiatives on governance, I hope, will extend not just uh, from the, the <coughs> public sector, but uh, I hope that we can take uh, continue to preach the high road on the private sector. Um, so that is a great challenge for, for, for us. Um, the other thing that I want to touch on is that in all of our markets, so we sell pretty much through every market in Southeast Asia. Uh, in, the, in Thailand, our customer is True Multimedia, one of the largest telcos in the mm -hmm. country. Uh, but lately, our main focus has been on the Philippines, and I'll touch on some of the reasons. Um, but in looking at the region, the cooperation that I'm getting uh, with, uh, with various people in the Philippines is that they really do want to do business with the United States. But the United States has also been very proactive in return. Um, we need to have that level of engagement <coughs> with more key allies in the region. And companies like mine can profit from that. Um, and the, I can say the, the administration in the Philippines is extremely open for business. Uh, and I just want to give you a, a little story of a, um, another company that works in our space, in, in the broadband space, uh, is having to move its supply chain from China. Um, all I had to do was send an email to Secretary Dominguez, Ambassador Romaldez, uh, and immediately uh, people on the level, the equivalency of, of like Secretary Munchen or, or Wilbur Ross, were helping this company and saying, hey, we're open for business in the Philippines, come do business with us. It was a remarkable uh, experience, and if we can forge that level of engagement uh, for other U.S. private companies uh, in the region, then I think we will start. Um, we will start to match the level at which some of our competitors in the region do business. Um, and so I just want to touch on some of the key challenges that exporters have. Um, number one, our big challenge is to be in the know. We don't know every infrastructure project going out there. So we're a medium-sized company. Even you know, probably the, the best example is General Electric. They're a huge exporter. They know every power project going on. But they're very few. The US is made up of small to medium-sized companies. We export prolifically. And we could do so much better if we are in the know and understand more of the projects that are going out in the region. So how to, how to, how to be able to tap into the Manila Metro project, how to be able to tap into the airport expansion, uh, in Indonesia, for example. It's, it's, it is a challenge for us and our resources are limited. Um, secondly, we need to be seen as a target uh, and not just have, you know, have to prospect for our customers all the time. I really believe the U.S. needs to go on a marketing <laughs> offensive uh, saying that you know, we are a destination to do business with. Uh, frankly, customers in the region doing infrastructure, their first stop is China, the giant shopping mall of Shenzhen. They show up there, they look for product, and if they can't find it, or if it breaks, then they come to us. We don't want to be the default. We want to be the primary. And the best way to reach these people is through digital means. Uh, I think we can go on a very strong offensive using various tools through social media, through, um, uh, through, through our websites and the like, and be able to make ourselves known that we are open for business. Uh, a lot of this can be combined with aspects of the Build Act. Um, that uh, we can make it easier for us to do business. Third, it's, very, it's hard to close deals in Asia. My company, we can't give credit to everybody. We can't take all the risks ourselves. Uh, you know, XM and over the years has had some tumult, but we need help not just in financing for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days a deal. We need to match what our competitors are doing in the region. We need to match China and Japan. The country needs to give loans to countries for infrastructure and then make sure that that business is run by U.S. contractors and U.S. content. Uh, a lot of the attitude in general in the U.S. government has to change. Whenever, whenever we give money, it has to be tied to U.S. manufacturers. That's what everybody else does. I work with German export authorities. I work with Canadian because we are a multinational company. And we've got entities there. They're very keen to help us, and they push for German content or Canadian content. Um, Third, uh, large U.S. contractors. There used to be a lot of companies out there doing things. Today, they're really in oil and gas, you know, Floor Daniels and the like. They've really fallen, and I think we need to, to understand that we don't go out and win these airport projects as much anymore. It's going to other companies. Uh, fourth, we have to keep, be keen to finance local companies. So we want to be the exporter, 
And, but local companies eventually will own these projects. We work in the energy field. You do microgrids, for example. Well, American companies aren't going to own microgrids everywhere around the world. It just doesn't work that way. But we have to be willing to engage those local companies, finance them, and have our technology exported to them. Um, third, we, well, honestly, we have to battle versus um, our Chinese competitors. And that is a, it's tough out there. They work under different rules. They have state-owned uh, enterprises that are financed. Um, it's, a, it's a serious battle for not business just in China, but for business in the region. Um, and then, finally, we need, a new, we need basically um, to consider that things like XM and other financing, it is not corporate largesse. This is part, the rules have changed globally. Okay, and it is not, when people talk, for example, in the past about XM and largesse, I mean, the rules have changed. And the rules today are pay to play. So if you want to be an infrastructure, this country has to be willing to finance that infrastructure and give that business to U.S. companies. It will get its return on investment in the form of taxes. It's a hard one to govern, I realize that. But in no way, shape, or form should it be considered corporate largesse. It is a battle today. And the combination between state initiatives and private sector has to be more culturalized, I believe, in the U.S. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for these very effective, um, uh, pointed um, criticisms in some way of, of how these emerging initiatives can, can take U.S. comparative advantages forward and unlock some of these resources and capital. Um, particularly uh, within the small and medium enterprise, because again, there's a whole host of stakeholders of, of, of firms out there that can become engaged, that are waiting to become engaged, but again, that the policy landscape isn't there and the market landscape isn't there for, for them to become engaged. Um, moving to, to government engagement, uh, we're really uh, honored to have um, acting DAS Roland de Marcellus uh, from the EB Bureau, the Economic and Business Affairs Bureau of the, of the State Department, um, and Acting <coughs> Das de Marcellus is not just um, uh, a, someone who has always been working in the EB Bureau, but he's worked in various um, uh, departments and agencies within our government that really touch on um, development finance and infrastructure. And we're really happy to have him here as one of the, the chief architects of these emerging initiatives to tell us more about specifically what is coming out of government. Thank you very much. <coughs> you have heard the expression, last but not least. In this case, it's last, but yes, least. Um, <laughs> because the important actors here are the, those who have just spoken, and the, those are the ones we want to listen to. The governance in the region, the people of the region we want to work with, and then our private sector. And get down to the details, uh, and the, I was writing a lot of notes from all three speakers, but the details of what we can do to bridge the gap. Uh, uh, Walter started with an outstanding overview, and I'm only going to pick up where he left off, but to his central point that was the point of Secretary Pompeo's speech at the Indo-Pacific Business Forum on July 30th, that our private sector is what we want to enable to help build infrastructure throughout the region, and globally, particularly in the region. And it's that private sector focus, which is uniquely American, and it's the long-term solution, and it's the best solution. So everything I'm going to be going into more detail on is with that in mind. The um, private sector brings two things. First of all, to highlight it, the amount of money that's waiting on the sidelines of the private sector that can be utilized. Uh, so it vastly outweighs um, any government capability, or even all governments put together the capability. It's the private sector. The private sector has always been the long-term <laughs> engine of economic growth. But secondly, what the, our private sector brings, and not just our private sector, any market-based private sector, is they do due diligence in any project to make sure it's financially sustainable, that they're going to get paid. They have to make money. As uh, Paul said, he has quarterly results. So they do that due diligence, and they're looking better than, I'd argue, even uh, a World Bank economist can do, down into the very, very depths of a transaction, the enabling environment, everything, to make sure they can return their profits and make money. This due diligence is, of course, in their interest, first, to make profit, but it's also in the interest of the recipient country. It's like having a free 
analytic work done for you to make sure that every element is ready for that project to pay to last over decades and be sustainable and pay a return. And that is, I would say, even more important than the amount of money, is also very, very challenging. So I've talked to many infrastructure experts, you know, international, uh, other governments, the World Bank's best, and they've got some very good ones. And everybody agrees the key problem we're facing is the shortage of bankable projects. There's plenty of need, and there's plenty of people willing to do it. And there are certainly countries like the Philippines and Thailand who are ready for business, but we are lacking the actual project that can be taken to the bank and get a return. And there are many elements that go into making it, it bankable, many of which Paul touched on. But it's you know, getting paid, being able to repatriate your currency I mean, your, back into dollars. It's our contract enforcement. I, there's a huge range of issues. But those are the elements that we need to address. And that is um, what we're going to be focusing on in part through all of the initiatives um, announced by Secretary Pompeo. So in brief, that's Asia Edge, you know, the power uh, sector throughout the region. A lot of that has to be capacity building and looking at specific projects and what can we do as the U.S. government, again, listening to the recipient governments and to the private sector, what's the missing piece that we can do through our partners uh, with at USAID, U.S. Treasury, the Commerce Department, uh, the new DFC. We have all kinds of tools, but we want to get them together uh, to address what is needed to make a project bankable. Once you make it bankable, you've got the solution. Uh, now, a frustration that I've heard from, that we've heard often from our own private sector, other governments, is when they have a, a challenge, they don't know who to turn to in the U.S. government. We have all kinds of outstanding agencies, but we're all in our own separate space. Uh, so it's all about trying to coordinate us better so that if Paul needs help or the government of the Philippines wants more investment, they know who to talk to. And so we're working on that as well, which I'll turn to in a second. The other is our digital connectivity, <coughs> the uh, digital uh, connectivity and cybersecurity partnership. And this is a global partnership, uh, but we'll focus first on the Pacific as a pilot. Uh, same as like the power sector, but imagine for telecommunications and digital connectivity. And then the third thing the secretary mentioned was uh, what we call ITAN, the Infrastructure um, Transaction and Assistance Network. For me, the network part of it is uh, probably the most important part, and that is where we're trying to address this, what has been a stovepiping of our various agencies and capabilities, and better coordinate through this network. We're still defining it, we're still working it out, um, so when we get to questions, I don't speak for too many details yet, but we're still working through that uh, very actively right now. But the basic premise is to bring all the players together and also have some resources uh, to again address uh, the particular gaps that are lacking for bankable deals. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Build Act, which we're thrilled about. We uh, work very closely with the Congress, administration, on producing this um, historic legislation. Uh, and I described some parts of it. The headlines, of course, are it goes from 29 billion in exposure up to uh, 60 billion, that, that's a good increase. But there's a lot of other improvements that we hope will make a big difference. One is the new uh, Development Finance Corporation, or DFC, will be able to take on equity uh, stakes, which we haven't done in the past. Uh, we have to be very, uh, we're still looking at the, all how we do this carefully. We can't take too much risk for the taxpayer. Uh, and Congress wants to hear how we're going to manage that, so we're working on that. But most other development finance institutions do take equity positions, and it's been a limitation for OPIC in the past in doing a joint uh, project you know, with JBIC or even IFC, others, where they cannot take the equity stakes. This left us out of deals. So we'll hopefully uh, be able to correct that. Another is the ability to lend in local currencies if currency risk happens to be the problem. Another is um, the DFC itself will have a pot of money to do the capacity building, so it in-house can address some of the gaps for bankable deals that, that are missing, in addition to doing feasibility studies. Now, U.S. Trade and Development Agency uh, already does a fantastic job on feasibility studies, and they will be working very closely with the DFC, uh, but there'll be some, if there are additional gaps, TDE does not work in every sector and in every country, so with the gaps, the DFC will be able to fill that gap. Uh, and then finally, 
with the Build Act. Again, it's better coordination. Uh, it'll, it'll be governed by a board uh, chaired by the Secretary of State, as he does for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, but involving uh, the Departments of Commerce, uh, Treasury, uh, USAID, and then private sector members as well, or private board members. Uh, so we can again, now having uh, that level of coordination at the board level and then below, to again make sure that all of the parts of government are working together, because uh, we really see that as one of the needs. Uh, and then finally, with all of this, and what we've been doing and why I'm so thrilled to uh, hear Paul's presentation, is listening to our private sector. To so find out, transaction by transaction, what's needed. Uh, and I've already written out everything you said, Paul, um, mm -hmm. and hope to follow up uh, with your associates. Uh, but with other companies, and not just uh, the U.S. I mean, a lot, we have an infrastructure um, dialogue with the Japanese that I found very helpful. We have another one with Australia later this week, where we can work together, because maybe, as Paul said, what if we don't have a major uh, American company building that airport, but the Japanese do? We need to work better at bringing together our private sectors, or the Australians, or other Koreans, other partners in the region, uh, with whom we can partner on these deals. The other is, um, so the private sector is our, we're listening to much more intensively, the other is our partner governments in the field. The governments of the Philippines and um, of Thailand, but every throughout ASEAN, the regional groupings and partners, we want to hear from governments themselves on how we can work together to create these bankable deals. Because that is what we have as our common objective for all three parties to this uh, panel. Uh, now, in some ways, too, some of the challenges, for instance, is um, life, the cost of a project. Because if you look at the life cycle cost of a project, you want to look at what the operations and maintenance is going to be and all of that. Often our, our firms are disadvantaged because they are longer, they are more expensive up front, but cheaper over the long run. It's very difficult to do procurement based on life cycle cost. The World Bank is helping uh, and others educate um, and build capacity on this, but it's very complex. But there's hope. Technology is helping us here as well. There's something called uh, building information modeling, or BIM, a new technology that can factor all this out. Because if you're the you know, finance minister of country X and you're given two options, and one is much cheaper and one's more expensive, it's a short debate. But if you can bring a more sophisticated level, like here is the cost over a 30-year span, then it's a, a much more sophisticated analysis and uh, is better for the people of that country as well. So uh, that type of thing gives me hope. Um, again, uh, as we've heard, governments are open for business in the region. Our businesses are ready to interact, so we're just ready to listen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Acting Das de Marcellus. Um, I think your, your final point on uh, calculating the life cycle of uh, a project, the various costs uh, incurred by a project, is, is, is an area of comparative advantage for the United States. And, that's not just um, calculating the costs of, let's say, delays uh, and, and holdups and cost overruns before the project goes online, but also calculating in something that, that my team works on, and those are environmental and social values. And, and again, our, our, I guess our, our brain trust here in the United States is leading the way on that and how to build that into the, the business model. Um, so we're going to move in. Can I just make one yeah, comment? Ahead, so uh, just on the total cost of ownership model, um, this is something we live and breathe every day. We're the quality supplier going into many opportunities. And, and what was said is exactly on, on target. And uh, I just want to highlight that what we need are new international finance mechanisms from the U.S. Uh, we as technology providers, we're not banks. We cannot afford to finance this over a longer term. But the way you win a total cost of ownership deal is by having it in some way financed. So that takes away the pain of a higher upfront capital cost. Uh, and so that's one of the things I'm hoping, uh, being ever hopeful and optimistic American that I am, that the BUILD Act will eventually morph into a way where we can take our, what I would say, national comparative advantages of TCO and be able to spread that cost over time. <coughs> 
We're going to move into our discussion, and I have to say we're going to have a hard stop at 11.30. Um, some of our panelists have to uh, move on to other engagements um, at 11.30. So I'm going, I'm going to ask one question, and hopefully we can dwell on this question for uh, a while. Very broad, and, and I hope that our panelists can engage with each other um, uh, in the discussion of this question. Um, very simple. Uh, what has been the reaction? Uh, to these emerging infrastructure initiatives coming out of the U.S. government in, in your home countries, in your sector, um, or even in the halls of, of government. Um, and uh, what can be done at this early stage to, again, identify the needs, the impact areas, uh, the ways in which these initiatives can be taken forward more quickly in a more effective manner? Um, I'll, Throw to a, a Ambassador Babe at the end. You've been sitting there <laughs> diligently and, and pondering. Well, uh, well thank you. No, the, the, uh, as far as the Philippine government is concerned, we are very pleased with this uh, new initiative t being taken, uh, especially this Build Act. Uh, uh, we have been um, we've been continuously asking uh, for more participation from U.S. companies or from the United States, actually. And, in our infrastructure program, and we welcome uh, even the digital and the cyberspace and everything else. Uh, but um, all of these, we want to translate into what it is we can do, uh, and we w we would like to see more American companies participate uh, because obviously we have other countries that are coming in uh, very strongly. Our our economy is is doing very well. We've We've got about 6.7 percent growth, so we'd like to see more uh, participation coming from the United States. Um, but more importantly, I think that what is the thing that we would like to point out is that we see this private initiative uh, investments as a way of going away from always depending on U.S. aid or U.S. Uh, government uh, help in, in, in all of these things. It's, it's more like a private partnership. And we're trying to make things easier for business to operate in the Philippines. Um, we have tried to cut down the red tape. All of these things are being done uh, all simultaneously. Uh, corruption issues are also being addressed very strongly by our president and, and our, our uh, economic managers. So hopefully, um, I think uh, Paul is an example of one who is experiencing um, good vibes as far as doing business in the Philippines, and we're hoping. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, he will be an example for many uh, American companies here to participate in, in, in the Philippine economy. We just got some nice POs this week, by the way. There you go. Mm -hmm. so. Good. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. As for Thailand, if I would like, uh, in this case, uh, mention about uh, Thai policy itself, um, we are welcoming the idea of uh, engaging more with uh, the region bilaterally and regionally. In terms of our national policy, we are promoting more and more engage and participation of uh, development partners in certain area. Uh, I would like to highlight some, the idea of uh, the policy of the government to promote uh, Eastern Economic Cooperation or to promote more investment in the, in the border area of Thailand, especially border between the, the neighboring ASEAN member states. So we would uh, welcome the investment of uh, uh, private sector from the U.S. for the bankable uh, projects, of course, in that area, which we are uh, working so much, so hard to make sure that uh, people in the border area of Thailand and the neighboring country will be uh, more prosper and uh, have better development and sustainable one. Thanks. A couple of comments. First of all, just in wording the act, the U.S. Had, has admitted it as a problem. So this is, you know, the first step. Um, but uh, I, I just want to highlight one, uh, uh, highlight one, please just don't fund feasibility studies. We can't just continue to fund consultants. We have to actually get in there and provide the right financing and leasing arrangements um, for export. Our competitors, for example, in the telecom space, they've completely changed the way telecom vendors, hardware vendors do business. If you look at the U.S. landscape 10 years ago, there were... Uh, 5x the hardware vendors in the telecom space. Lucent, anybody heard of Lucent recently? They've disappeared. 
Okay, they've been what we call in the industry Huawei. Okay, mm -hmm. Huawei comes into a deal, and they they will not only offer the equipment at a very attractive price, but they will finance this now over ten years. They will provide three years of interest free, no payments. You only start paying in the third year, and then you have very low payments over the next seven years. They've completely changed the equation in the mobile infrastructure landscape, which is, you guys know, with 5G coming, is massive. So um, we really, this is the environment that we are competing in uh, today as Alpha. Um, the other thing I want to say is that government isn't easy to work with. We talk about who to go to. The farther you're from D.C., and it doesn't get much farther where I am. I'm 25 miles south of Vancouver, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, the less expertise companies like mine have in dealing with the government, I only started doing government relations two years ago for a 43-year-old company, okay? Um, so one of my recommendations for something like the BUILD Act in these agencies is to have regional offices, especially out on the West Coast, because that's where our largest potential for export of technology products is. Uh, so, you know, take some of that federal office space for DHS and the like and put some people we can link up to and meet with on a regular basis. It's hard just to be a DC animal and to fund that type of uh, infrastructure. Um, I also want to comment on, uh, I would definitely like to see U.S. commercial services at embassies to be strengthened. We love them. They're great. Um, you know, today's model is good. I see it stronger in some other countries where, you know, they don't need, they should be told they don't need to be neutral. They really can push for specific companies. It's okay. That's what our other competitors do. Um, boy, I would like to see an expansion in that. And we'll make that money up in export tax revenues and, and, the, and jobs and the like. Um, and then also, just to finalize, make U.S. content requirement of uh, a uh, a re U.S. content a requirement for all U.S. government funded programs. Uh, you know, if you take, for example, uh, I've been working with a group called Power Africa for a couple of years, and I can say honestly, three years ago when I was working with them, their goal was to add uh, gigawatts in Africa. And I often found our Chinese competitors profiting from U.S. taxpayer money that was out there to get people connected in Africa. That's a great goal. But um, what's great in the last two years is that or since this administration came in is all of a sudden they started pushing for my products to go into certain projects they're like yeah let's put in u.s content they were great so even like a us tda in one project uh switched from uh, schneider electric which is a french-based company that manufactures in china to our products that come out of bellingham washington for a project they were funding so uh that change in attitude in the last two years has been fantastic and that has to be mandated, and there's nothing we should be shamed about if our taxpayer money is paying for it. So, uh, you know, let's continue to have that attitude because I think we are a fantastic technology and manufacturing uh, country, and, and we can grow even more. So. Uh, thank you. I've, um, I, I was quite pleasantly surprised by the reaction to the speech. We were worked with Walter early on developing uh, – Secretary Pompeo's uh, speech in July uh, and getting the Build Act passed, of course, uh, very helpful. Uh, but we've been quite taken aback by the response in the region of interest, of countries that want options. You know, if, who doesn't want more options uh, and more options and more options? Uh, so, but I, I think the, the key for us, I mean, just to be candid, is we have to deliver. And uh, so that's why we're working hard and uh, want to hear people. And we want to actually build, build, build uh, with our build. Uh, so uh, the onus is on us now. But these are – it's a challenge. Bank, making a bankable project is not an easy thing. That's why it hasn't happened. So uh, we've taken on quite a task, but we have to deliver on it. So that's what uh, we'll be working on. You've also been working hard to write down all the, <laughs> the suggestions uh, that have come oh, yes, from the definitely. panelists. And, and hopefully we get more from our audience as we turn to um, a Q&A session for the final 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes of, of our event. Uh, we've got two microphones in the back, um, uh, Mike uh, with the mic. We'll be uh, delivering the microphone to whomever has a question. Um, one request is to identify yourself and let us know um, where you're coming from. Uh, and uh, please keep your questions brief. Thank you. Here's one. Hi. My name is Sarah Bonner. Um, thank you for uh, the great presentations. And I hear you, Paul. I used to be in your, um, in your shoes. 
Um, I heard a lot about different agencies working with um, these resources in the Build Act. I, I, in full disclosure, my name is Sarah Bonner. I work at the U.S. Small Business Administration. I didn't hear SBA in there, and um, at SBA we work to make sure that small businesses that meet our size standards um, can participate in government procurements. Um, is there any room or plans for SBA to be part of that? Thank you. Thank you very much for correcting my oversight. Um, yes, very, very much so. Um, and for instance, on the board of the bill, uh, we don't have every agency, uh, but we're going to be coordinating more broadly. And SBA is a key part. When Paul, you mentioned the challenge of small businesses, I was thinking that's well, SBA and out in the region, I mean, uh, and fanning out the word throughout the U.S. corporate community. Because uh, you know, small businesses, um, that's really, it's where, in any country where employment is created, and that's why SBA, SBA's role is so key. One thing we've developed with, uh, within our bureau, again, to help small business, and because you said it's hard for you to find out what's going on. <coughs> so we built a website called BIDS, B-I-D-S. Uh, you can Google it, that puts uh, globally uh, projects that are up for procurement around the world. And so ha we have all the World Bank projects. We ask our embassy officers to upload projects. So hopefully they, that's something that in Bellingham you could click on and say, oh, here's a map of the Philippines. Here are projects that the mm -hmm. Philippine government wants done or the Thai government. Mm -hmm. So working, our embassy is working with those governments. And often it's not going to be at the federal level, but uh, state or provincial level to try to get that out there so that so again, there are a small business person who can't um, have a presence here and can't afford to pay for the more expensive services. Here's a free one. Uh, so, uh, but no, SBA is key, and thank you very much. Uh, and we definitely want uh, SBA as part of our solution. So if I could offer a recommendation, it is to link up with SBA on their website, push through social right. media that this website right, exactly. exists. Um, so. Hi, good morning. My name is Oliver, and I work with the private sector in uh, several Philippine infrastructure projects. Uh, example, the subway at the airports. We, to some to varying degrees, we work on that. My question is: is it was covered in the in the Build Act that uh, the finance side of the Build Act? Does the Build Act also cover the technical side? So, for example, large U.S. infrastructure firms who wants to go to the Philippines to to develop their tunneling technology or bridge span technology, will the Build Act also uh, coordinate with those private sectors in the technical field. And then as a comment, that was the question part. The comment part is that you mentioned about a, uh, a, a list, a database of projects. The Philippines has that in the PPP Center. Mm -hmm. So in the PPP Center, you, you'll find the big ticket Philippine projects and it will help uh, collaborate and link with the U.S. private side. Thank you very much. On the first question, I, I don't think I fully understood on the technical yeah, uh, the Build Act uh, it was presented in such a way that it will uh, it will uh, facilitate the, the the flow of capital. But will it also facilitate the technical side? Like uh, like for example, there's a build build a big bridge program right. connecting the islands of the Philippines. But it might be too huge technically for the Philippine infrastructure firm. Can the U.S. side does the Build Act yes. also coordinate with the uh, U.S. engineering engineering firms? Yes to go there because I, I haven't heard of the technical side, only the finance side. Right. No, thank you very much. Uh, yes, that is an improvement in the Build Act. That it, it will be able to build that capacity in, uh, better than what OPEC used to have. I be, correct me if I'm wrong, I think ITAN is, is focused at doing that as well as Asia yes. Edge for right. capacity building. Right. They, they'll do capacity building as well as well as within Build itself, mm -hmm. that's correct. And if I can do a quick two-finger. Um, with Asia Edge, is this enabling U.S. government agencies to to more deeply engage in capacity building, or a broader set of stakeholders from the United States to be involved in capacity building on, on, on energy um, capacity in, in Indo Pacific? I think it's still being fleshed out. I think initially U.S. Uh, and I don't know the degree to which we're going beyond. But hopefully, in partnership. Ambassador Maisto. Thank you, and congratulations, Brian. It's a great program. I was at an event last night, and I met someone from a big U.S. infrastructure company. I won't mention the name of it. 
I mentioned the BUILD Act. I mentioned BUILD, BUILD, BUILD in the Philippines. And I suggested there might be some interest. His response was, you know, we're very big. And we're very particular. And there are a lot of countries that want us to invest in them. Uh, but we either can't or won't. Now, I'm wondering if the BUILD Act is going to address the big companies, because I'm coming away with the conclusion that the best opportunities are for the medium-sized companies like Pulse. Mm -hmm. we're, we're less picky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yes, the goal of the BUILD Act would be for all size companies. Uh, again, the challenge is if you are on the board of that company, you'll do the project that will give you the highest predictable return. Uh, and so that's where the work has to be working in partnership with governments uh, to make sure that the investment climate is such that, that they can make they can see that return. Uh, so that that's uh, that's the job that has to be done. But certainly, yes, build would apply to any size company. Some questions here. I, I just want to say, as a small to medium sized company, we want to see those large ones winning because we supply. To them. So every General Electric gas turbine, for example, comes with a million dollar alpha backup. We back up the control systems of every gas turbine. So we love those big guys. Hi. Good morning. I thought it was very interesting pre presentations from everybody. Uh, first off, I want to say to Paul, I'm one of your biggest fans. I'm one of those commercial officers that have been overseas for the past 15 years, get to come back here for one year before I go to the Philippines. So I'm very excited about being here today to hear this. I'm also very excited about the BUILD Act and what it means for uh, these infrastructure projects overseas. The one question that I have to Roland and to the other members of the group is, AID has always had their, you know, the, the goal of development and arm's length to U.S. companies. I was wondering what will the, the new, and OPIC of course has been a very profound partner for U.S. companies, but uh, they've also had to structure their mechanisms in a certain way. I wonder what you feel about AID and the, the history that it has in that arm's length and how it will be able to overcome that in the future. Well, I think the preference is always going to be for U.S. company to build or any other entity. Um, there's, there's so much, there are different parts of the work that have to be done. So some of AID's work, uh, let's say on an enabling environment, isn't necessarily company specific. Uh, so, uh, but I certainly with uh, Administrator Green, his journey to self-reliance uh, at USAID is very much focused more than the past on the transition to private sector growth and to uh, what we said earlier about trying to move from beyond being a, um, a recipient of, of assistance, but uh, it, it was a very exactly the right point, um, to just be an economic partner and make it a, as a financial relationship. So I think uh, this is certainly something that AID is looking at now within their um, uh, transition strategies, uh, but it'll be a, a team effort. But, and, but certainly, I'm very glad you're here from uh, uh, and then we headed out to Manila, and so we hope we stay in close contact because I, I agree totally with Paul that our FCS uh, officers are essential to this. We have time for one final question. Hi, Ivan Gonzalez from the Philippine Embassy. I heard a lot about Build Act's uh, greater ability to finance projects, but what about its participation with financial institutions in the U.S.? Uh, would there be a way to involve other financial institutions in, uh, I guess, make more complex financial instruments for loans? And uh, would it would the U.S. government be open to uh, more uh, open openness to the seniority of liens and other loans and the involvement of bigger projects uh, through, uh, I guess, greater involvement of um, other financial institutions? The um well, certainly part of the goal is partnering with others, like for instance, with, we have a, a new memorandum of understanding with Japan between JVIC and OPIC. And OPIC is already, even an advanced build, trying to establish more of these to partner even better with other institutions. Uh, and 
probably will take uh, undertake more complex deals now they have equity authority. Uh, so I think that is part of. I, I can't don't know yet the exact level of detail of the. I can't predict that, but uh, that's certainly openness to that. And one thing I wanted to mention is I forgot to when I mentioned on the um, uh, building um, information modeling uh, that you might want to know, uh, Paul, is that the government of Vietnam has taken this totally on board. And this is a case of, of uh, the government decided it's in their interest. That they've mandated that all their infrastructure, I think after 2021, must use this software, this technology. And they've already put out the first 20 projects, uh, whether financed by the government itself or anybody else, must use this technology. Uh, so um, it's just something uh, that there is movement, uh, uh, positive movement, again, based on technology. So we've come to the end of our event, um, but this is uh, just the end of our, our, our second event that is looking at building the Indo-Pacific. We're hoping to host a, a third uh, before Thanksgiving that invites more stakeholders from ASEAN. Uh, as again, as my team focuses on Southeast Asia, uh, on how these emerging initiatives can make a deeper impact. I hope those of you that came today uh, have learned more about these initiatives uh, and are thinking deeply about, again, the, those impact areas, the opportunities that the U.S. has um, to become more deeply engaged in the region, uh, as well as um, ways to, to uh, make make this more effective so that we can get to the finish line more quickly with the unfolding of, of these um, initiatives. Uh, just a big picture um, look at things is I think we've heard that countries in ASEAN uh, want to do business with the U.S., um, want to engage more deeply with uh, U.S. companies, small, medium, large, and with the U.S. government on these initiatives. Uh, the U.S. can offer a clear alternative uh, and a more sustainable alternative and a more equitable alternative, I think, um, than what is being offered in, in the region today. Um, and as we look at um, another message that has come out uh, uh, recently and, and also was enunciated at this event of uh, uh, supply chains moving out of China into Southeast Asia, to get those supply chains going, you need quality infrastructure. You need to get goods and inputs to the factories and to the market on time. Uh, so the more quickly um, and the better that gap can be filled, um, the more efficiently um, ASEAN can develop and, and economic development there can continue on growing sustainably into the future. Thank you all for coming out, and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you to our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Oh, on that very issue, how do we get? I talk to them every day. So. Yeah, let me just double check. <laughs> I'm not sure who it is. I'm not sure I have the name. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can work Office of Japan Affairs. Yeah, yeah. So they don't seem to have the names. Okay. Of I'm sure Steve Weaver. We'd love nice to Japan. talk to you. Sarah works with me at SBA International. Okay. So we would love to chat with you. That'd be great, oh, Brian. How long are you in town? Uh, you know, sadly, just till tomorrow. We, uh, <coughs> it, it, it was, I just came out for this, and I really have to rush back. But I come here, I was here a couple weeks ago, but that was more terror issues. I'm actually here more to close. Yeah, we're trying to just analyze our positions, and I'm here to try to finalize. I was over at the Thank you. Sure, that's love to.